The Canon EOS R5 isn't out yet. It hasn't even been announced, but that hasn't stopped me from ordering some gear and accessories for it, although most of those items have not even arrived yet. Do you want to know what's going to be in my camera bag? Let's get into it. Delivering informative capability-based reviews and tutorials on camera gear, filming techniques, and content creation. Hi, I'm Simon, and this is The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, subscribe to get notifications of new videos as they come out, and all the links to everything I talk about in this video, including all the gear, well, those links are placed in the description down below. I'm still using this Low Pro bag, and I don't know why I like to call them Low and Pro, but it's a Low Pro bag. I got it with my 70D, and it's old. It's definitely seen better days, but it still functions well. It's been around the world with me, and it doesn't scream new camera inside, inviting would-be thieves to come and investigate. It's small. It's lightweight. I can easily fit the R5 inside, the RF 24-105, the RF 15-35, EF 51.8, four memory cards, four batteries, white balance card, lens cleaners, and of course a reader, adapters, and cables. It basically packs everything I need as an ordinary filmmaker and photographer. It fits easily into pretty well any plane's overhead compartment, or in my car, in my trunk. It easily travels with me. I've had those big travel cases and backpacks. They look great on TV, they look great on YouTube. I hate them. They're big and they're cumbersome, they're heavy, and they make me sweat, especially in summer. For pros, this low and pro, it's not gonna be sufficient or offer enough protection, but for most ordinary filmmakers and photographers, it's good value at $80 and works in most scenarios. I published this video about OEM versus knockoff batteries. I conducted a poll and pretty much all of you said that OEM batteries outlast knockoffs, delivering consistent power over their life and lasting a lot longer. Now OEM, for those not familiar with the term, means original equipment manufacturer. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, let's look at it this way. For the R5, the OEM would be Canon. For the A7 IV, the OEM would be Sony. In the past, I bought Power Extra batteries. And you know what? They perform very well. I've been shooting with them for over a year, and I still get over 90 minutes of record time. They die when they're completely discharged, instead of halfway through like some knockoffs. And at $10 each, it's really hard to ignore those savings. But the R5 is a beast of a camera, with high power knees, especially when being pushed. To get the most battery life and record time, without resulting to that heavy grip, I'm going to stick with OEM. I'm still using my Canon battery that came with a 70D seven years ago, and it still gives me about 30 minutes of video time, and it won't shut down the camera until completely depleted. Not bad for seven years old. And hopefully when we do get the final announcement for the R5, we'll get some pretty decent battery specs. The R5 will cost more to operate. Batteries and memory cards will cost more. Don't cheap out on these two accessories if you're going to be shooting a lot of video or fast continuous shooting. For casual use, knockoffs like Duracell or Power Extra will be sufficient and do offer good value and performance. The right memory cards make for a better recording experience. They get the content off the camera much faster. And as a content producer, time matters. Fill up a 512 gigabyte card and you're gonna want the fastest transfer rates possible, especially if you're under the gun. I recommend the pro-grade Cobalt 325 gigabyte cards. The Cobalt has a max read speed of 1600 megabytes and a max write speed of 1400 megabytes. Slower advertised speeds compared to other cards, but those advertised speeds are pretty much meaningless. Those numbers, as they are, well, they're really the best possible numbers you can get in the best possible situation and probably come from the marketing department. The Cobalt is guaranteed by ProGrade not to drop below 1300 megabytes a second, and that's significant for doing video or fast action sports. I really do wish card makers would advertise minimum sustained write speeds or minimum write speeds in general. These cards aren't cheap. You'll want to validate the exact speed and size of your storage before putting them into production. I recommend using H2 Test W for Windows and F3 Read for the Mac. These are not the most friendly pieces of software, but they are highly effective. Now, F3 for the Mac can only be run from the terminal. Don't try and download the um, GUI version because it just won't work in the newer versions. But they are pretty simple to operate. Now, I test each card before I put them into the field. 
They write to every part of the car testing to see if it's fake and give you the average write speed. You don't want to get out into the field with a 128 or 256 card without testing it and finding out they're really only 16 or 32 gigabyte cards. What a lot of fake companies do is they'll sell these things on Amazon or other companies saying that, hey, they're 128 or 256 gigs or something else. And what they really are is just a 16 or 32 gig card. And what they do is they alter the firmware so they report a higher number. So what happens when you record? No problem, you can record some files, but once you go over that card limit, they start rewriting at the beginning. So essentially everything you've shot becomes corrupted. If you're not going to be dealing with high-speed video or photos, SanDisk cards are generally cheaper and should do the trick. The 128GB cards should be sufficient. Prices are still high for CF Express and should stay so until the end of the year. But with more cameras coming to the market with CF Express, look for prices to drop from late 2020 to 2021. CF Express is becoming the new default high-speed card, easily surpassing Q QXD. Uh, I don't know why I can say that. I like to say XQD for some reason. I know it's tough to spend so much money on storage cards. You can spend as much on two cards as a single RF lens, and I'm not talking about the cheapies. But without good, reliable storage, we don't have the results to show for our investment. It's like buying one of those high-end performance um, Lamborghinis or Ferraris. You're not going to buy one of those cars and then put El Cheapo tires on them, are you? One last thing about SanDisk cards. They do have a lifetime guarantee, and I buy their cards all the time primarily for that reason. Now, I did have a couple of cards fail uh, just a few years ago, and I had no problem reaching out to SanDisk and getting those cards replaced quite promptly. However, make sure you keep your original proof of purchase. Without that, you're not going to get cards replaced. While I have a modern computer with a UHS-2 SD card slot, it doesn't have a CF Express card slot, so that means getting another adapter. The ProGrade CF Express card reader performs quite well. There's lots of reviews on YouTube, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. Suffice it to say that it only costs $39.99 and it's pretty good. It, it's capable of up to 1.25 gigabytes per second. The link to this and everything I've discussed so far can be found in the description down below. RF lenses are far from cheap. Regardless of the downside, I always protect my lenses by tossing on a UV zero filter. It's far cheaper to replace a damaged UV filter than to get a lens repaired or even replaced. I can't count the number of times I've clumsily bumped into something like a door frame or a tree or something else, and the lens is fine. The UV filter just saves the day. They also absorb ultraviolet rays that can make our outside photos appear hazy. Canon sells the EF to RF adapter, allowing us to take any EF lens or EF-S lens and mount it onto the RF platform. Sorry, no EF-M lenses can come. While there are over, while there are over 100 EF and EF-S lenses, results vary depending on the age of the lens. No issues have been reported with adapting any of these lenses, but older EF lenses have loud and slow focusing motors, which are not suitable for video and EF-S lenses adapted to the RF mount will maintain that 1.6 crop. The EF adapter is small and won't take up much room in your camera bag, so that's good news. I also carry several lens cleaning accessories from this pen to microfiber cloths and, of course, cleaning solutions. This pen works by removing dust and debris from the lens as well as small smudges. So simply, this end here, it has a little uh, brush that I can use to brush the dust off and of course on this end you just have to unscrew it It's got a little gadget at the end and you can use this to just brush Smudges off the lens for larger smudges. I recommend using a microfiber cloth with a lens cleaning solution and Always keep a white balance card in your bag. It will save you a ton of time bouncing and post the auto balance tool in Final Cut as with other software does a pretty good job most of the time why fiddle with balancing colors when you can nail it with a white balance card? Now I bought this white balance card from Peter Gregg. You can also get other cards on um, Amazon and other sites. And what they do is they'll have like the white part, they'll have a gray and a black. And quite often when you're balancing, you're kind of focusing on that gray to get the best results. So I tend to use the gray to balance out most of the time. 
I can also do the same with Peter's card by tilting it. What happens if I tilt it just like this? What happens when I take it in post? This area is a bit shaded, giving me that perfect gray that I need. And it's a great low cost tool that saves you a ton of money and it hides away easily in your camera bag. For most run and gun work, I use the Rode VideoMic Pro. It captures your subject's audio very well, yet still captures ambient sounds like birds chirping, I was gonna say trees chirping, um, leaves, um, the flowing of water, all without overpowering. Sounds won't feel cut off or hollow, but lifelike. It's powered with a nine volt battery, but they were smart enough to add a simple LED light on the back, so it's easy to know if you've got the thing on or not. I also use a Sennheiser shotgun mic, and it has a light too, but it only, and while it has a little LED light there, it only comes on when you turn the mic on. It's a way of saying, hey, it's alive. I hate it. I'm always leaving this thing on, or I'm forgetting to turn it on, and it's really frustrating. I've actually shot an entire scene, <laughs> and I thought it was on, and it wasn't. So um, the Rode Video Mic Pro, it's a great mic. Now, for studio work, I use this Tascam DR10L. I chose the Tascam because I can move around and the sound is consistent. For this setup, I could have used a shotgun mic, but the Tascam gives me greater flexibility of movement. I can easily take this setup outside, I can move around, or if I'm moving fast or my son is moving fast and I've got this on him, it's very effective. It, it, however, if you do want to use a shotgun mic, I make what you really want to do is you want to make sure that the shotgun mic is as close to you as possible without going out of frame. And for those situations where you're doing this type of work, I'd recommend the Rode NTG. It does a really good job and, well, it provides great results. I think there's about a $50 difference. The Tascam's $200, where the Rode NTG is about $250. Both provide good results, just have different scenarios. So it's really up to you to decide which one works best for you. That's it for now. The links to everything I've talked about in this video, which includes a ton of gear and accessories, can be found in the description down below. And if you do happen to click on any of those links, it will take you to Amazon. And if you happen to purchase anything, I will get a small cut. So just trying to be transparent with you there. But thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. We'll see you again soon. Thank you for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. All equipment used and notes are placed in the description box, show more box, or down arrow thingy next to the title on the mobile app.